Hey everybody, welcome back to a refresh session, my very first screencast on how to continue our work around promoting excellence for all. As you recall, when we met in February, we did a lot of talking about um, students who have experienced traumas and chronic stress and their feelings of safety. And what we learned is that this isn't just a social issue, it's something that has actually changed the physical biology of the students, particularly in their brain chemistry. And so it's important to remember that even though we create a physically safe environment here at, at school, they may not feel psychologically safe, and that can create some of the same triggers and, and anxieties for students. So we wanna work to create a, an environment that reduces that anxiety so that they're most available to learn. The research really suggests that it's a very simple idea of strong student-teacher relationships and developing a learning partnership is really the key to building a trusting environment for students where they can feel relaxed and ready to engage in learning. And again, remember, we're really trying to find ways to get all kids engaged so that they feel purposeful and motivated in their work and they become more independent learners. But until we develop a trusting and safe environment, that's nearly impossible. So thinking about the brain and stress and the idea of psychological safety, when students come into school that, that are in environments um, that maybe have been used to chronic stress, um, they uh, have a tendency to scan the environment for threats. And so what happens is that sensory data, I mean, really anything from their environment is fed into their brain. It goes to the thalamus and it goes to the amygdala. Data is also sent into the cortex and it does a whole lot of processing. And the amygdala is really what is responsible for that quick threat assessment. And because it happens so quickly, brains often default to typical brain patterns. So if your brain pattern is to scan the environment and always perceive threat, they tend to do that in the school environment as well. And when that threat system is activated, they call it an amygdala hijack, and the amygdala stops to slow or starts to slow thinking. Um, creative processes, problem solving, really the ability to just input any information is really slowed down significantly. And we actually get kind of an unthinking response. We might not see that when we're looking at our students, but if they perceive any kind of threat that's happening, making any kind of learning that's going on around them nearly impossible. And if they are taking any of it in, it's certainly not sticking in a way that we really would want them to access it and retrieve that later. So the key is to create an environment that is so low stress that that amygdala is not gonna get hijacked and we're not gonna get that un unthinking response from students. The cool part is that we can change that. So when the brain feels safe and relaxed and we're connected with others that we trust, um, our brain starts to release something called oxytocin. And that oxytocin is actually a bonding hormone and, and kind of reverses what that amygdala hijack was doing and really relaxes that whole system. But it comes down to that piece of and with our kids that come from chronically stressful environments, maybe they've had traumatic events, the ability to trust is much more difficult. And those are those kids we're having maybe a harder time developing strong relationships with. Um, so if we can work on some strategies to relax that environment, build up that trust and rapport, we're gonna create a brain that is ready to learn. The other cool thing is that when you're in sync with students, there's something called mir mirror neurons that help us connect and get in sync with each other. We actually start mimicking each other over time. And again, that happens when there's been more um, rapport and trust um, established. And that synchronizing triggers a relaxation response, both from that student, which is what we're hoping for, but it really establishes that same kind of oxytocin release in our own brains. Um, and it just, it, that relaxation um, really opens us up to more learning and more authentic experiences. So the important thing is letting, letting their stories or letting who they are be heard. We wanna start building authentic connections about who students are, what they have to say, how they feel. And when we are able to establish that, 
we establish more of a trust bond and we're able to raise those expectations for students because the trust is there to do that. We're building an alliance with them. They feel supported. They feel like they're in a partnership with us. And when challenging situations come, and I mean academically challenging, where we want to have them persevere through difficult tasks, they feel like they can trust what's happening and, and that amygdala hijack doesn't happen because they're not getting stressed out. So we want to develop growth mindset and prevent learned helplessness. So two things I challenge you to do between now and when we meet in March. And as you recall, we kind of picked a student in our classroom or in our, in our um, you know, that we have interactions with that maybe we feel like there hasn't been that strong relationship built with. And I challenge you over the next couple weeks to spend extra attention with this student doing two things. One is listening with grace. And that seems really obvious as teachers, but oftentimes our days get so busy and rushed that when that particular student is talking to you, um, listening with grace means we're giving that person our fullest attention and really listening to what's being said. We're trying to process the feelings behind what he or she is saying. Um, we're really trying to suspend any judgments and just listen with compassion and honor the cu speaker's cultural way of communicating. So if this is a student who has had some traumas or chronic stress in their lives and they're maybe communicating in a way that isn't typical, sort of set that judgment aside and, and spend more time hearing what they have to say. And students can sense that, and that's going to really help in terms of that communication and that trust that we're trying to build. The second is intentionally building in trust generators. And this is something that I'm going to put in everyone's mailbox tomorrow. These trust generators are just five strategies that um, really are, are effective with students, but they're also effective with maybe some, some families that we've struggled to make those connections with as well. Um, and there are five different things selective vulnerability, familiarity, similarity of interests, concern, and competence. And these are um, described much more closely on the um, information I'll be putting in your mailboxes. Take a look at it, reflect on it, and see if there's a way to naturally build that into your interaction. Again, thinking of that one particular student in mind. So give it a try. Thanks for kind of maybe going out um, and, and giving that extra special attention, I know in a very busy time, but it's never too late to work on that strong student-teacher relationship and develop that learning partnership. And if we can do that with 12, 15, 20 more students before the end of the year, that's hugely successful. So thanks for all your work and good luck. Looking forward to hearing um, any results you have when we meet in March.